uh, well, just a little tragedy. Um, when one of our sister churches uh, in there, hold on one second. Wait, no, that's not right yet either. <laughs> there you go. When one of our sister churches here, um, their pastor suffered a fire. Um, and uh, if you don't know, it's Ed Beddingfield, if I said his last name correctly. Um, Ed, of course, the pastor at Memorial Baptist Church in Bowie's Creek. Um, right now, all of the data that I've gotten while I've been gone has totally been towards helping them out financially. Um, I have not gotten any requests in for furniture or clothes quite yet. Um, money can be given directly to Memorial Baptist Church to help support them. You can write a letter uh, and, and, and give it to Memorial Baptist Church, uh, and, and Ed will receive it right over there. Okay? You can write a, a, a check to their church and, and put on their emergency funds. Um, and that's kind of the direction that we're leaning towards right now. Uh, once more needs have come up that we know about, of course, you know, that daughter's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, was injured in the fire uh, and he lost his wife. And just a, well, tragic. Um, nothing that they were expecting on Christmas uh, Eve. And so we, we, we join with our sister church over there. This is the first time they've gathered on Sunday morning since this tragedy occurred for their pastor. So we're going to pause and pray for them. And pause and pray that God will lift them up in the middle of tragedy. They'll even be able to get a glimpse of eternity and hope that far outweighs what we can have here today. So if you would, raise your right hands with me and kind of just reach them out, just kind of like you're reaching. Am I even facing the right way? Kind of like you're reaching over there towards their church. Kind of like you're praying for them. Heavenly Father, we ask that in Jesus' name you would bless Memorial Baptist Church this morning. That as they gather and they have friends that are suffering and hurting today, that you would minister to them in a special way. We lift our hands just to say that we're Christians with them. We understand loss. But we know that you're much bigger than that, Father. Uh, we pray for Ed and for his family that you would uh, even give them a glimpse of heaven. Maybe they, they might even have some security with your presence and peace right now. Father, in, in the lack of knowing what to pray for, would you just show up for them and show up for his family? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you want to, you can contact the church. We've got that, um, we've got that address. We're ready to hand it out. And we want to encourage you to be a part. You've been so generous already all Christmas long. We're just going to have to step up just a little bit more. Uh, as soon as more things come out, we will be glad to let you know. Okay. Um, number two uh, is, is worship time. We want to continue to lean forward in that. And I'm thinking about New Year's resolutions. Have you made a New Year's resolution this year? I, I, I don't know about you guys, I've just had the same resolution all the time, you know, try to be a little bit better father, try to live a little bit better life, but there are people who, who think January 1st, this is it, I'm going to start a new trend, I have this desire to be a little thinner, so I'm going to start losing weight come January 1st, because all, November, excuse me, all December long and November long, we just did not follow that rule at all. I'm joking, but we really do. We have this desire to lose weight, and so we, because of the desire, we try to birth some action in, uh, uh, on the 1st of, of January. Some people desire, I, just like I said, I want to spend a little more time with my family. I want to hang out with my family a little bit more because, you know what, family is an investment. My daddy always told me, when you get to heaven, you're never going to ask God, I wish I had spent a little more time in the office. And you know what? It's a lofty thing and right. I wish I'd spend a little time with our family. And so because of our desire, we want to put some action behind that desire to spend a little more time with our family. We want to say, you know what? I want to be a little bit happier next year. And so because of that desire, we try to do a few things to put some action behind a desire. Uh, have you ever noticed how many New Year's resolutions are built around me? I want to be a better father, so I'm going to spend more time with my family. I want to be a happier person, so I want to do this. I want to lose weight, so I want to do this. I don't know what the percentage of people is that, um, I don't know how to say it best. I don't know what the percentage of people is that don't make selfish resolutions. But I want to ask you, when you think of making a resolution, a change, or starting something new, is it generally selfish? I'm not here to cast any stones. Mine are selfish enough. It's just a question. I wish that our New Year's resolutions would, well, they would kind of correct themselves this year. 
Because if you haven't noticed, most of us give up our New Year's resolutions somewhere around January the 2nd. Some of us might make it to February the 2nd. A few of us might make it all the way to March the 2nd. But the truth is, a lot of us drop our resolutions along the way, right? I have found that my, most, my best fulfillment, my most fulfilled times that I get in life actually come from serving other people. I am more fulfilled when I love others more than myself. I want to, I want to amp that up a little bit more because I've also found myself more fulfilled not when I'm asking for things for myself, but when I'm serving God and trying to get to know Him better. I have found that more of Him makes a better me. And I wonder if at this uh, holiday time we might put that into our New Year's resolution. That we might say, this time God, it's, it's for real. This time it's for real. And since all of my past New Year's resolutions never really stuck, you always stick. And so I'm going to try, I'm going to try it this way. I'm trying to make more of you in my life than anything else. God, I'm going to try to put you above everything else because I have found that everything else that I'm trying is not working, so maybe this one will. Maybe, maybe if we had a great love in our heart for God, that would be birthed out of our actions as well. Look, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to keep on moving forward. Today is seven days past Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Seven days. You know what tomorrow is? Tomorrow is eight days past Christmas. It's New Year's Day. It's important. If you have your Bibles with me, open up with me to Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, we're going to pick up after the birth of Jesus Christ, what occurred. And I'm going to start reading. I've got to turn my Bible there too because I closed it between the services. Uh, I'm going to pick up reading around verse 21. So if you would, um, just kind of pick up right there with me. On the eighth day, when it was what day? On the eighth day. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. And when the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph, Mary, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. For as it is written in the law of the Lord, firstborn. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him that by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the, Lord, the Lord's Christ. I would underline that in your Bible. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts and when the, the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to, to do for him what the, com, what, what, was custom, what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. Hmm. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, we just lift that word up and, and lift up our hearts and minds. Holy Spirit, just guide us in these few moments. Uh, speak to that through that word to us that we might become more Christ-like. Bless us with your presence. Father, use my words and make me more adequate vessel only because of your Son. In His holy name we pray. Amen. So as you see in this passage, Jesus' first, first time out. Now, if you were a parent, do you remember the first time you took your children out? It was a mixture of nerves and excitement. Because you didn't know if they were going to talk, you know, cooperate with your plan. How many times, you know, we've all had that opportunity where we took our child out and they messed up their clothes before they got to the door. Or, or are they going to behave while we're sitting and doing something? Are, are they going to appreciate? Mine right now is we want our children to make sure they talk to all adults. You know, Hello, how are you doing? I'm so glad to see you. Just simple things like that. 
Do you remember the first time you took your child out? And then you were excited because you wanted to show your child out. Jesus leaves eight days and heads back, excuse me, not for eight days, uh, but for an appointment at the, the temple in Jerusalem or, or appointment in Jerusalem eight days later to be circumcised. So if you remember last week, there was an 80 day, 80 hour, excuse me, 80 hour trip between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and now they've got to turn that around. Somehow or another, they've got to make their way back to Bethlehem, they, they, excuse me, back to Jerusalem, um, and they've got to, to take Jesus to be circumcised. And, and this is a little distant from us. Um, circumcision, I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail about that. You can talk to your family doctor. Um, but circumcision is, well, circumcision was a sign of separation between the nation of Israel and the entire world. It, it was saying for the nation of Israel, you are a separate and sanctified people. You are not like everybody else. So it was a national thing to do. It was also a spiritual thing to do because they were spiritually separating themselves from their world. But even more than that, it was a spiritual separation from sin and a sinful lifestyle away from God. <clears throat> it's not just that we want to be a separate from the world, but we want to be close to God. And so there was this ceremonial circumcision that, that separates and sanctifies. Um, and so if, if, you're, if you're tracking with me, Jesus, eight days later, about New Year's Day for us, uh, makes their way back to Jerusalem for circumcision so that he might be separated and sanctified from sin. Doesn't that just sound strange? Jesus was already sinful. I wonder if they went in with the physicians of the day, if, if Mary was going, well, why do we have to do this? He's already sanctified. I wonder if Joseph thought, I think this is kind of useless. They're already sanct. He's already, he's Jesus. He's the Messiah. He doesn't need to go through this process. I wonder if those people that were there doing the procedure went, this is a special baby. Well, I don't even know if he needs circumcision. He's so special. That's not what happened, was it? Although it's true. This was, this was ceremonial for Jesus. He was already pure. He needed no separation from sin. He was already sanctified because He was the Son of God. He was already unique and special. He was the, the perfect Adam, the second Adam for us, that we might cling to Him. He didn't need to be circumcised. So why did he? I have a small theory. If you ever had an encounter with an angel before? I've, I've not. But Mary and Joseph did. In fact, Joseph had more encounters with angels than Mary did. But Mary's seemed to last longer for us. Her song or something, she just went longer. You know, uh, really. When you've had an encounter with the divine, I think that overflows into proper religion. And I don't, I don't want to overstate it, but I want to state it just right. For us, when we've had a dynamic encounter with God, like Mary and Joseph did, that overflows to proper religion. Look, um, there is religion for religion's sake. There is doing what I want because I want to do it because I think it makes me feel good or it makes me conform to a certain pattern. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about an action that comes out of a deep devotion. We're talking about a, a, a religion that stems because they love God so much. They've had such a dynamic encounter with God. Have you had an encounter with God lately? That so changed your life that it outflowed into action, into proper religion. Where your worship is genuine because your sins have been cleansed. Where, where you've got a revelation from God, a new encounter, and so your Bible study is a little more unique. I think proper religion flows out of that dynamic encounter with God. Now we're going to talk about that. We're going to flush it out a little bit more. But I think that's why Mary and Joseph went up there. Because they had a dynamic encounter with God. Do you know what happens when we try to move out without God? 
when we try to make a, a religion based on what we want versus a religion based on a revelation from God. You know what happens when we do that? It's called hypocrisy. I want things to be my way, and so this is what religion should look like, and I'm going to start obeying this way. But God's going in a different direction. So I'm, I'm being hypocritical to God. God, I'm, you're, you're over here, but I want things to be like this. It, it makes false teachers out of us. And a, a, a false religion. Because God's over here, but we moved out on our own and made a religion that wasn't based out of devotion or love, but based out of, well, I should just do this and feel that way. Ultimately, I believe it revolves around selfishness. Because I want it to be my way. That's the way it's going to be. It proves to God two things. Number one, it proves that, that we really don't trust Him to have our best intent. That we really don't, don't believe that what God says or does is right for us. Or number two, number two, that our way is better than His way. Now you would say, Daniel, man, that's pretty rough. I don't really think that way. I just, I just want you to, to track with me for a few moments this morning. When was the last time that you asked Him how your day should go? What should my worship look like today, God? When I open my Bible, or, or should I open my Bible, God? And what do you want to teach me out of it? And, and as we do that, we get to know Him better. But when we don't do it, and we go home, and as I was talking to our children about today, we go home and take our Bibles and we put them down in a safe place because we want to come back to it next week, right? We put them down in a safe place because we don't want to forget them. But we don't come back to them because we, we're Sunday Christians. Some of us aren't even that. And look, I'm not here to step on your toes. I'm just here to extend the invitation. God has more for us today. God has so much more when we get to know Him. Um, because we believe in our mind that if we were just doing something, if we were just generating something, if I were just to do something, then my life may change. We do the opposite of New Year's resolutions. Okay? We do the exact opposite of a New Year's resolution. A New Year's resolution is supposed to be, I have this desire inside of me to change, so I do something. We think the opposite occurs. Because we do something, the desire comes. Because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to worship or have a good Bible study, then my life's going to change. And that's just, that just doesn't work out that way, does it? That's backwards. Now, God can do amazing things. Look, I don't want to limit Him. I just want to tell you, proper religion starts in our hearts. Because he lives there. I know that sounds like I'm, I'm from first grade Sunday school this morning, doesn't it? But it's just about right. It starts in our heart because the Holy Spirit lives within inside of us. And then because of that dynamic encounter, things go out. Now we're going to look at that through the life of Simeon over the next few minutes. I want to show you a picture though. It's going to kind of stand up and be our, our marker for the next few minutes. Matt. When I first saw this picture, it kind of breaks my heart. It kind of stirs me at the same time. I kind of want to break that gate down. Um, I, I, I don't speak good German. I just happen to know what that one says. Albeit not to break. This is the front gate to the Dachau um, concentration camp. Uh, if you look back there in the back, I, I've never been there because you know I'm scared of flying. But if every flight was like mine this week, I'm going to be okay. But I was told that one of these buildings right here in the back is actually one of the gas chambers. So that right when you walk in the door, you can see what, what future is like. Now, these are places where people were tortured and killed because they weren't like the master race or whatever. Look, I, I could probably harp so long about how bad this... They, they did... Um, they did experiments here on babies at Dachau um, to see how babies could last without the nurturing effect of parents. They didn't last. How horrible is that? Um, and this is the gate that you walk through to get there. And this is translated work 
brings freedom. And they, there was this false idea, of course, within fascism as well, communism, that we work for the common good and that we work and it brings us some amount of peace. That if I just work hard enough, then I'm going to make it there. And I don't want to harp too badly about that because some of us just really need to dig in. And we gave up long before we were supposed to. But this bad theology to think that we can work our way to the amount of freedom that frees our hearts and frees our minds. In fact, that's the opposite of work. That doesn't work out anywhere. Work brings labor. Work brings pain. Work brings suffering. Because that's what work does. It's called work. It's not called fun. Anyways. But we've, we've, we've made this the gate to our life. That if I just work and do the right things in my religion, then God's going to show up. Everything's going to be okay. And then God doesn't show up. And we get mad at Him. And we get disappointed. And we give up on Him just like we give up on our New Year's resolutions when the results don't come quick enough. Look, work doesn't bring freedom. That's what Jesus Christ was meant to do. And that's what He does. And so as, as this stays there, I want this to kind of fluctuate in your minds as we move forward. What gate is locking you up? today because Christ wants to free us and this is going to be the year of freedom amen this is the year that we give up our hearts and minds to God totally this time it's for real isn't it because this time it's all about him and not about us um, so they cut they they have this pilgrimage they make it back to Jerusalem they go through this ritual purification period so while they make it back for cir- circumcision um, there is a, a ritual purification which is about 40 days. And ladies, like I, I just can't justify this in any good way. Okay, 40 days for a man, 80 days for a woman. One is considered, uh, it's a period of bloodletting and the woman is considered to be impure. She has to go through ceremonial purification processes and, and then after that she's allowed to come back to the temple. So after the purification process, some of you are looking at me strange. I'm with you. Because I just, in my mind, number one, when, I, when we had our children, it was just awesome. You know, it was a blessing. It, it stirred our hearts. We wanted to show our children off to everyone. It wasn't, it wasn't an issue of purity. It was life and it was celebration. Different culture and that's okay. But I wonder if Mary sat back at the home front fires and went, why am I doing this? Jesus was already pure. There's no impurity involved here. I wonder if Jesus, I wonder if Mary was sitting back going, was kind of, no, she wasn't. Because she had a great encounter with God that spilled out into a great love. So I imagine she's at home going, oh God, thank you for this baby. Thank you for cleansing and purifying me, not because I'm sitting at home or going through the processes, but because of who's here with me. She goes through that ceremony of purification. They're allowed to go back to the temple. And they go dedicate their child at the temple, which is the right thing for every parent to do. Whether you're young or old, grandparent, great-grandparent, just regular parent like me. Um, whether you're a child, it's, exact, excuse me, it's exactly right to go to worship with your family. Go to Bible study with your family. It's great. It is the right thing for us to do, to do family worship. And I want to continue to encourage that. It is the first step of obedience that Joseph could do to honor his wife and his son. Pick them up. Let's go dedicate our child to the temple. But there's there's that dangerous phrase in here for us. I'm looking around verse 23. Why are they presenting him at the temple? Because every firstborn son, male, is to be consecrated to the Lord. Consecrated as in, they thought that redemption for the male line, that that service for the family bought family redemption, bought individual. So every child, every male child is presented at the, the temple. Because something is going to... It's that whole work is freedom. It's bad theology. We present our families because we're already gods. Because he, we, we belong to Him. Not because I can work out my salvation, because He's already wrought it. And I'm giving my entire life to Him. And so they come and they, because of their obedience, because of a great love and encounter with God, they follow 
They offer up a sacrifice. Uh, the, the traditional sacrifice was a lamb. Okay, if you were rich. But if you were like me, well, you gave two turtle doves or a pigeon. Turtle doves known for their singing, pigeon, common animal. And you brought those in for sacrifice. Mary's pure now. She can enter. But you remember how far she can go into the temple, right? She can only go up into the court where the women are kept and no further. I wonder what happened after that. I'm so glad those barriers are gone. But I wonder if she stood out there and watched Joseph carry Jesus with the doves just a little bit further for the next sacrifice. And she had to sit outside and watch while they were inside. I wonder, I I don't think she was begrudging because we live in a different culture. But I think she was looking on just like we would. That's my son. That's my husband. That's my Savior. What she's doing is, or what Joseph is also doing, is twofold. They're presenting the Messiah to be dedicated at the temple. I wonder if like, all of the angels stood still on that day. Because Jesus, I mean, God actually entered the temple. Like, like if, if Jesus were to walk in right now, would we get it? W- w- would our pews be shaking? Would we fall down in devotion or stand up and pray? Would we? Or would we, like everybody else there, miss him? There's one person that didn't miss him, and it was Simeon. Simeon was a priest that was promised that he would not die. He would not, uh, and he, in Greek, excuse me, he would not be separated from God until he saw the consummation of Israel, the comforting or the rest of Israel. In other words, he was promised to see the Messiah before he passed away. Jesus enters in, and and there is this figure in the temple named Simeon. Simeon, possibly the son of Hillel, which is a famous uh, teacher of legend. But for all we know, he's just Simeon. Some some godly priest who it's his particular week to serve rotation time at the temple. There are thousands of priests. And Simeon just, just happens to be there. It's a little bit more than that, though, isn't it? Who, who, let's, let's, let's think about who Simeon was in the passage. He was um, a devout. He was uh, faith righteous. Uh, he was devout here as in he had a good character, a good reputation. He was righteous as in made right before God. That's a huge statement. Who's made right before God? Only those who have embraced Jesus Christ. And so Simeon, before the birth of Christ, had been embracing Christ as the promised Messiah and was called righteous. Simeon was a person who is known to have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, that we would be a people filled with the Spirit. Have you heard from him today? Let's let's just be honest with each other. Have you heard from the Holy Spirit today? Because I just imagine that's what Simeon's life was like. He wakes up, he reads his Bible. Because he knows in his biblical scrolls that in order, for get, in order for him to get to know God, he's got to read about God. He's got to study who he is. He knows that he's got to spend regular time in prayer and devotion because you can't get to know God or get the blessing of God unless you spend time with God. He knows that he's got to come to worship and have dynamic worship with God because he loves God. And he knows that he goes out and serves Him because as he's trying to get to know Him Trying to be like him, he's got to go out there and do what he did. So how do how do you get an encounter with the Holy Spirit like Simeon did? Man, I wish we would be like Simeon. We probably need to spend a little more time in our Bibles, don't we? We probably need. I made a resolution with a group of buddies. We're going to read through the Bible in the first six months of the next year. That's just Bible reading. Let's also be devoted to it and studying it. Uh, you know. Let's be more about Christ in worship than about ourselves. Let's only... Do you know what happens when you get a visitation from the Spirit? I said it at the beginning. Proper religion comes out of you. But if we don't have visitations from the Spirit, then our religion becomes about us. And what I want. We move where we want to go instead of where God wants us to go. And we find ourselves, sometimes not by purpose, sometimes by accident, sometimes absolutely on purpose, 
out here in right field when God's turning around second and trying to make His way home. Look, I'm just trying to get you to hear the life of Simeon. That those who wait on the Lord, those who wait on the Lord get the dynamic experience. If we move on without Him, it's going to be about us and we're not going to get the dynamic experience. I wonder how many times Simeon goes into the temple and goes, that's the one. Today's the day. I wonder if he ever looked at some child and went, oh, that's, and it really wasn't him. Or did Simeon just sit and wait and wait and wait and wait? And then he did the most uncool thing that any parent would just, we, we would just be really upset with Simeon. He picks the child up. Can you imagine that? It's his first time coming to church. Some Simeon come gets him. It's the baby Jesus. He is so something inside of Simeon's heart because he's had dynamic encounters with God, dynamic encounters with the Holy Spirit because he spent time getting to know the God that he's professing to serve. Something inside of him rubs off with something on the inside of Jesus and he recognizes who it is because he spent time waiting for the Messiah. Can we wait for the Messiah? Let's stop going out on our own. It's not about me. It's all about Him. This next year is the year of the Lord. It's His year. And that means Jesus over everything. Over my desires, my wishes, my wants. That even means I don't get to, to, to put my chips in until I say, God, where do you want us to be? Where do you want my life to be? I want that to be a regular phrase for each one of us. Daniel, have you heard from the Lord today? Where is He wanting us to go? Or, or vice versa. I've heard from the Lord today and I feel like He wants me to be involved in X. Simeon says, after he, with this great joy, picks this baby up. Moms, we would all be freaking out if somebody came and picked up your baby without your permission, wouldn't we? He says to God, now, now I can depart, for I have seen salvation. And he's not talking, so we think he's talking about dying. And, and, and he's talking about more than that because this departure has a set of beautiful pictures that I'm going to share with you for a second. The beautiful picture is, number one, of sailing. It's the idea of picking up your anchor and, and letting go of this shore to go on to the next. And I believe that God's saying that to some of us here today. That you, Look, you guys have been going off on your own, and sailing on your own. It's time to pick up your anchor from where you are. Leave that shore and come to me. It also holds the idea of, of picking up your tent. Like in the military, you're told it's time to depart and it's time to go pack up your day stuff because you're going to a new campground. God's inviting us to come to a new campground, the campground of the Messiah. He's inviting us to leave our, our tents where the, uh, excuse me, Leave the old campground that's filled with self and come to the Savior that's filled with fulfillment. Will you pick up your stakes today? Um, two things for you. Number one, I'm doing some research now on camping. and Trust me, I have no desire to go camping because it's cold outside. Because who wants to sleep on the ground? I mean, come on, I've got a nice bed that with my family and I saved up for. I want to sleep in that bed. Um, you know, and so I'm doing some research. How do you pick out a great campground? Number one thing to do, over and over again, call the place where you are going and ask if there are any rules or regulations that you need to know about before you go camping there. That's just awesome. I mean, that really is great. I mean, that so applies. How many of us, before we set out in our lives... Call God, who's the author of life, and say, God, where do you want us to go? How can we get there? What, what's the travel destination? Where do you want me to set up my camp? What are the rules that you have for me? Because I know that where you've got for me is the best place for me to be. Today is the day to ask. Today, He's got the regulations, not, not like a rule book, but the fulfillment of life. I challenge you, I ask you, I invite you. How many of you ate too much at Christmas time? Okay, we need to get holy and start asking for forgiveness. 
How many of you ate too much at Christmas time? <laughs> I ate entirely too much. And I ate like at one parent's house. I went to another parent's house. Then I just kept eating. And snickerdoodles, homemade snickerdoodles are just my favorite thing in the world. Uh, I'm not a big turkey fan, but snickerdoodles, oh my goodness. There was a person who was mentally challenged, who had a devout relationship with God, and he once said that, that our lives are a lot like being put in the oven. We go through the fire, and we don't know how long we're going to be there. But while we're there, we're getting cooked and prepared. A lot of us like to look at our alarm clock and say, well, I only have to be there for 15, 17 minutes. And then I get to leave. That's not waiting. That's trying to go to a destination. A lot of us say that I'm only going to be here for a certain period in my life and then I'm going to get up and go. There's a problem with that. That's not waiting on God. That's telling God when you're going to go. And we live our lives kind of like this egg timer and thinking, got it. I'm moving on. I only have to be... Well, what happens when we, when we spend more time there than we wanted? What happens? Today we learn the lesson of waiting on God. Next year is His year, so we're going to have to wait on Him all year long. And that's right and good. We're going to spend time in His Word. We're going to spend time in worship. We're going to spend time in service. Because that's how we wait. But I wonder whose egg timer you're listening to and setting today. Did you set your own egg timer? And say, God, this is as long as you got. And if you don't meet my standard, I'm moving forward no matter what. Or are you willing today to say, God, in your word, in your worship, and in your service, I'm not going to leave until you say I'm done. And then I'm ready to go. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to be